Last week we started a study of, of the Ephesians 5, and we're going to cover verses 1 through 21. We spent a great deal of time, first of all, showing that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. That means that's where he's located them, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. We then pointed out what is said in the first two verses of verse 1, where he says, Be ye. We gave emphasis to the meaning of the word in the original language. We won't do that again. Except we gave this grammatical part. It's so important because it sets the tenor of the rest of the material that we're going to study and that Paul writes about here. And that is that's imperative. Imperative means you must do it. Any way around it? No. It must be done. So we're seeing some detail of what it is to be faithful, to be full of faith. Some weeks ago we pointed out that when the Bible talks about believers, it's not just saying you mentally affirm the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. It includes that, but it doesn't stop there. A believer, as far as God is concerned, that saves a person is an obedient believer. Many times it just uses the word believers because that stands for the whole of what it is to be a Christian. And we're seeing in these verses a letter written to Christians, part of the New Testament, concerning living the Christian life. We're seeing an imperative. We're seeing Christianity in action. Think for a moment. Christianity is worthless if there's no action to it. Thus, James spends a great deal of time in James chapter 2, again writing to those who are Christians. He doesn't have to convince them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God or that they must believe on Him and it, they must repent of their sins and confess their faith in Him. They've already done that. They've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which delivered them, being then made free from sin, they became servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17, 18. He's already said to them in James 1, 25, that whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but watch it, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. That's action. So Paul really is discussing a lot of what James does. And in one way or the other, this is discussed throughout the New Testament. Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's action. You can acknowledge him as Lord all day long. You can say that he's the only Savior of the world. You can say he is the way, the truth, and the life. All of that. But if you don't submit to his will, then you can't be saved. If there's no action to your faith, you can't be saved. If you love me, Keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So when we look at this, we're able to see Christianity in action, and it's an imperative. If you want to go to heaven, you will do this. If you don't, then don't. Just don't do it. Now, also from verse 1, I find the way that this is to be accomplished. I remind you again, it's an imperative language. I said last week that we are to be imitators of God. And we're to do it as beloved children. That means these people are children of God. They're members of God's family, 1 Timothy 3.15. And as children who love their father, who care about their father, then they are to be active in the beloved. They're to love one another and they're to love God. They're to love their neighbors themselves. Now, none of those things say that if you have a good, warm feeling and best wishes toward somebody, that you don't ever have to point out their sins. Paul wrote the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. And yet it was he who withstood Peter, another apostle, and an apostle before him, to the face because Peter was to be blamed. 
Peter didn't teach a false doctrine. I think that's important to understand. Peter did something. Actually, he did not do something that was sinful. So it's interesting he's talking about action here. This is wrong action. What did he do? Well, he ate with Gentile converts, his brothers in, in Christ, until certain ones came from Jerusalem, and he wouldn't eat with them. That doesn't involve a teaching of false doctrine, except by example. And Paul had to correct him on that matter. So it shows us that to love one and wish them the greatest good, which ultimately is getting everybody to heaven, then one must teach the truth. And one must deal with people who are going contrary to the truth. So we're taught, as Paul taught Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we studied about agape there and the importance of it and its various usages. And here it was agape te. And um, it's traced back to the noun agapao, which comes from agape. Christians are children of God then through his love. I read to you, but we start again here in 1 John 3, 1 through the first part of uh, uh, verse 2. Beloved, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Now remember Paul said that you're dealing with all these things as beloved children of God. For this cause the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, John saying the same thing Paul did here. Beloved, now are we the children of God. And he stopped there. Of course, the passage goes on. But for our purposes, we know that about love. We have been, as Christians, as the Bible defines that word Christian, created after God. I don't know that we give enough thought to that. We as children, through our close submission to the gospel of Christ, and we remain his children through a close walk with the truth of God pertaining to godly living. If you look at Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, you'll see this uh, love of God that we are the beloved taught very plainly. In fact, I don't know, as I think about this for a minute, I don't know how, hard, how one can hardly look at much of any of the letters written to churches or to individual Christians and not see either implied or directly stated to one extent or the other that particular fact. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, But like as he who called you is holy, be yourselves also holy in all manner of living, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Again, 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. And in one way or the other, and that's said. That's, this is a be ye, you must do it. You want to know what it is to be faithful? Because only the faithful are going to heaven. Who is going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? It's going to be the one who does these things. Because this is showing the details of the general statement of being faithful. And it is a must. Matthew 5, 48, ye therefore shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Which means spiritually complete before God. When an individual realizes how he has been so loved, then it's easier to walk as a beloved child of the Most High. You don't find the attitude that says, how little can I do and think God will accept me. That very disposition of mind means you're not accepted. The attitude of the child of God who is beloved of the Father is always pushing to be more active in carrying out the will of heaven to the best of one's ability. So as God's children, we're to walk in love. And that's going to be the next thing I want to mention. And we're to walk in love because love is the fulfillment of the law and it's the motivating principle in all of God's actions toward man. I don't know how many scriptures we could cite on that, beginning with John 3, verse 16, Romans 5, 8. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, and on and on you could go. But this walk of the Christian is to signify 
the whole round of the activities of the Christian life. Now, I didn't give this last week what I did when I was preaching this at Huntsville two weeks ago yesterday. Notice that we are instructed. We're seeing component parts of what it is to walk in love. This action in which we are to be engaged. First of all, Romans 6, 4, Paul tells us, walk in newness of life. In Romans 8, 4, walk after the Spirit. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 13, walk in honesty. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, walk by faith. Ephesians 2 and verse number 10, walk in good works. Colossians 4 and verse 5, walk in wisdom. In 2 John verse 4, walk in truth. Then in 2 John verse 6, walk after the commandments of the Lord. Then he tells us what not to walk after. In Romans 8, 4, walk not after the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3, 3, walk not after the manner of men. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, walk not in craftiness. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk not by sight. Ephesians 4, 17, walk not in the vanity of the mind. And for now, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, walk not disorderly. So, when any of us take a deep look at these positives and negatives, I begin to comprehend, at least a little bit, what Paul is saying in this statement, walk in love. I wish some of these people around who just equate all love of anything with some sort of a warm feeling and emotional arousement of some kind, would look at what God said about love. You don't just have to define the Greek word agape. And that is the kind of love God has for all men because he seeks all men's highest good. And that is to be in heaven with him someday. We don't have to just look up the agape to understand 1 Corinthians 13. It's defined really there. The whole chapter is defining it. But we look at this and we see then this goes, I'm not saying you can't have a warm feeling about doing God's will. That's not the point. The point is, you're going to love doing God's will even when you kill you for it. That's the point. Or when they're beating you for it. Or they're putting you in jail because you do what God said do and the way God said do it and for the reason God said do it. Because this love seeks another's highest good. Paul sought Peter's highest good when he was stood him to the face. Most of my brethren said, well, let's just don't have a fuss. I just can't stand fusses. Well, I wonder how many of them said that when Paul was stood Peter to the face. Very ideal. Peter was up there preaching and doing things with the Lord himself long before Paul came on the scene. Here he is standing up talking to him like that. That's the way my brethren think, a lot of them anyway. The way people in general think. But that's not the way the faithful child of God thinks. Now I'm basing this walking in love on the fact of 2 John and verse number 6. This is the love that we should walk after His commandments. Now how hard is that to grasp? This is love that we should walk after his commandments. Now I don't know how you walk after his commandments and not obey those commandments. And obedience is action. And it's not trying to earn your own salvation or merit your own salvation. It's trying to accept what God has given us and to accept it as action on my part. A person knows that he knows him. John says, that makes any difference, if he keeps his commandments, 1 John 2 and verse 3. Not only that, John gets very bold. Well, should I say John or the Holy Spirit? God gets very bold in writing to those Christians and to us when he says that we're liars if we say otherwise. First John 2 and verse 4. To the individual who walks in love, 
What does that mean? That means they keep the word of the Lord. John says this about that individual that keeps the word of the Lord. The love of God has been perfected in him, 1 John 2, 5. Now, I don't know of anybody that if you were to ask them and they claim to be a Christian, that if you say, do you want the love of God perfected in you? Why, hands would go up all over the place. But among a lot of those folks, if you said, must you obey the commandments of the Lord? They'd look at you with gritted teeth and say, you legalist. Well, I sometimes feel somewhat like, like the fellow said one time, well, let me define that term and I'd not rather be legal than illegal. But what they mean by a legalist is somebody making laws where God never made any. I'm opposed to that. But I'm very much for keeping the laws that he gave me. How can I be that way? Well, we've already quoted James 1.25. That if we are walking in the perfect law of liberty, that means keeping it. Remember I studied just a moment ago on walking? Then that's how we are pleasing to God, to sum it up. And John says, if you have the love of God in you, and if you really love your brother, he'll say, you know it because you keep the commandments of God. Now, as I look further into verse 2, I find the willingness, willingness after which my instructions are to be patterned. The willingness after which my instructions are to be patterned. And the example or pattern is none other than the Son of God himself. Note very carefully these three statements. Number one, even as Christ also loved us. Number two, gave himself up for us. And that as number three, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet Smell. Now back in the Old Testament and the offering of incense and sacrifices, burnt sacrifices, as they were living righteous lives and kept the law and offering those sacrifices, God is saying that's an odor of a sweet smell. Now you say, well, have you ever smelt burning flesh? Does that, that smell good? Well, that's not the point. You missed the whole point. If you think he's talking about the smell of burning flesh, it must have been all around the temple and before that the tabernacle. Blood all over the place. Well, what did it mean? It meant you're doing what I told you to do in the way I told you to do it and for the reason I told you to do it. And in that way, you're manifesting your love of me and my will in the only way any human being ever can. That's what he's saying. Oh, I have great faith in God, and I'll show it, but I won't obey him. I love God with all that I am, but if I'm not going to obey him, then how are you going to show it? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. American Standard says, ye will keep my commandments. Kathos, Greek word. Kathos is the Greek word for even as. And it comes from kata, according to, and hos. Just spell hos and leave the e off. <laughs> it's transliterated, hos. It seems, therefore, that the writer is saying, that each one of us as children of God is the way the Bible defines children of God. According to the way Christ did, we are to imitate God. That is, even as or according as. That's what he's saying. We're to have the same attitude toward God's will for our lives as members of the spiritual body of Christ as Christ did toward the will of God for what he had to do in him doing what was needful to save man. And Paul clarifies this in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, when he says, Be ye imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. American Standard Version. Christ imitated God. That's why I can say, when you see me, you've seen the Father. People get hung up on the idea that, well, they looked at his fleshly body and they didn't see anything but a Jew. Well, they missed the whole point. I guess people did at that day and time like they do now. But he's talking about in disposition and attitude and conduct. So we imitate God. We imitate God 
by obeying Christ. I'd like to see how a person could imitate God, deity, and not obey Christ. The only way I can imitate any man is if that man's imitating God's Son. And that's what we're told. Do so Paul would say, follow me as you see Christ living in me. So Jesus became the great example of life, even as Christ also loved us. He emptied himself, that is, he gave up the form of deity and took upon himself the form of a man. I didn't say he gave up deity. I say he gave up the form of deity. Don't know all that means, but he gave it up when he took upon himself the form of humankind and thus came and lived as we did, tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. Thus he could become and did become the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Thus he could go to the cross, not for any evil he did, but for our sins and die on the cross. Read Isaiah 53. In verse 3, I'm told of the absolute separateness that each Christian is as a beloved child of God that I am to have relative to the practices or in opposition to the practices of disobedience. If you look in the latter part of verse 6, let no man uh, deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You're not to be that way. You're to speak as the oracles of God, as Peter said. First, I want to look at the Greek word mayday, not mayday, but mayday, M-E-D-E, transliterated. And it is, and I said last week I'd be doing what I usually don't do in this study and appealing to Greek and sometimes the grammar, not just the definition of words, but it's followed by the word onomatzesto. And the second word is third person singular, present passive imperative, and it's from onomatzo. It simply means not even or not so much as. Now, a Greek wouldn't have any problem with that. He would know by the use of it. But we do because we don't construct our sentences and say it the same way they did. And that's why when you translate from Greek into English, as is true of a lot of languages, that you have to use sometimes several words to get what the, what the Greek only used one to use. But he's saying, really, don't let these things be named once among you. It's a prohibition. And it's an admonition. Whatever is of the world and the way people live in the world should not at all touch you in any form or fashion, not even one other. When I think of practicing pure and undefiled religion, the latter part of that says keeping oneself unspotted from the world. Not one spot of the world led by Satan should be on you. And onoazo means to name or to mention. She used Romans 15, 20 and Ephesians 1, 21. And taken together, these two words are translated as should not even be mentioned among you. And you'll notice how many more English words had to be used to say what just two words did there. And the King James, now that was American Standard, the King James says, let it not be once named among you. Now because of the warfare, you do know we're at war. <laughs> do you think anybody in Israel knows, doesn't know that Israel's at war? Do you think anybody in that, that little state that's not much bigger than the state of New Jersey do you think there's any citizen of the children of Israel, of the modern state of Israel, do you think none of them know they're at war? But what about the army of the Lord, the church of the living God, the family of God? Do you think some of them think we're at war or not at war? And if it is, what kind of war do they think they're fighting? Well, the war begins with you and me dealing with our own selves to examine ourselves, see whether we be in the faith. 
So there has to be honest, objective, knowledgeable examination of ourselves. Now, if Peter had been a little more what he ought to have been, he would have withstood himself. He would have caught himself when he started pulling himself away from those Gentile brethren, when he had eaten with them until others came from James down there in Jerusalem. Evidently, that uh, bothered him, and he stumbled. But notice, this wasn't even an overt teaching of false doctrine. It was a lack of practicing the truth. Sometimes I get the idea of my brother think, well, you cannot correctly discipline a member of the church unless he teaches false doctrine. Well, what are you going to do about Paul and Peter? Find where Peter ever taught a false doctrine. You can't. What about Ananias and Sapphira? What false doctrine did they teach? Or you say, well, they taught by example. Nobody would have known they had done what they did except the Holy Spirit revealed it to Peter. It did not involve them going to class or before an auditorium of God's people in Jerusalem and teaching something false. And involve their conduct. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the conduct of members of the church, of children of God, who serve God as beloved children. If I'm looking at the warfare here, and you can see also that's brought out in Galatians 1, beginning verse 16, I might say that in English we often need to cry out loud, they can play on words here. I said our word a while ago, M-E-D-E, was not Mayday. But to make a play on words, many times we might want to cry, Mayday, which means I'm in trouble. Somebody help me. Remember when Peter saw the Lord walking on the water? And he said, Lord, if it be you, bid me come to you. And he, and he started walking on the water too until he let the affairs of this present world and the storm and the surges and you just don't do this kind of thing. And what happened to him? He began to sink. You remember what he said? He cried out in his own way, Mayday, Lord, save me until that disposition of minds in us will never be all that we can be and ought to be. Now he named some things here that are unnameable to the, those following God, those imitators of God. And this, shall we call it a battle cry? The Greek word mede onomatsesto. Do not let these things even once be heard among you. That's pretty blunt. You mean God expects that? Well, what would he say if he didn't mean that in order to say it? Can't get any clearer than that. It takes a real on your guard to keep these things from even once making entrance into your lives. In effect, he is demanding of each one of us, this is what it means to be faithful, a living martyrdom. That's what's really said in Romans 12, 1 and 2. They were to present our lives a living sacrifice. And that's what we do in being faithful. Everything puts God first. That's what Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, notice the watch that's involved here. This involves the things that shouldn't be named in the verses, uh, in verses 3 and 4. In verses 3 and 4. Three of these are fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. I guarantee you today that most members of the church do not put all of those on the same list. They don't think covetous is, is that bad. But the Holy Spirit and God, in other words, put it right alongside fornication and uncleanness. A covetous person may never commit fornication, may never be unclean. But God says, if you're covetous, you're not anything different in sinning than the fornicator. These are mentioned in verse 3. That is filthiness, foolish talking, and jesting. That's verse 4. The other three is verse 3. So let's look at these for a moment. Fornication. 
Well, America should know what it is, but they don't choose to run around saying, I am a fornicator. It might be if they'd tell the truth, they would say that. I'm out, I'm, I'm out, I don't mean to be light, but I'm out fornicating you. <laughs> well, I got to catch up. What is a womanizer? So, Christian shouldn't have any of this around him. Pornia is the Greek word. It's a broader word than adultery, which is moikai. Uh, it means prostitution and chastity, every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse, and even sexual immorality in general. I'm not going to give you all the verses. Romans 129 is one other where the Gentiles had departed from God, did not want to retain God in their knowledge. You see it committed by members of the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 1 and so on, listed one of the works of the flesh, the Galatian churches, Galatians 5, verse 19, and so on. Of course it includes homosexuality and lesbianism. It doesn't make any difference what is politically correct about not saying those things. That's what it is. And if you become a Christian, you'll have to repent and turn from those kind of things. And it's not impossible to do so. Paul said to the Corinthians, such were, past tense used to be, not anymore, some of you. Why? To say we hate homosexuals is stupid if you're a faithful Christian and against what the Bible says a Christian does. If anybody loves, put love in quotes, homosexuals and fornicators and adulterers, it's the faithful child of God and all New Testament defines that person to be because we'll show them the way out of that. We'll show them the sin and it is sin and show them what God says is the way out of it through belief in Christ, repentance of sins, obeying of the gospel and walking according to the teachings as we're studying right now. So don't let anybody say because we point out that those things are sinful and sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. They separate men from God because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23 and Romans 6, 23. Because we're trying to show them God's power to save them from their sins. I listened to, and I'm still in the process of listening to it, you heard me maybe mention, I think I turned and asked Ken who the fellow was, Dr. Tour down here at Rice University. And he's a whiz bang when it comes to professor that he operates in the area of uh, physics and computers. But this has happened about a week or so ago. He was on stage and I was listening to him. I've been following him for since, ever since I've known of him along with various others. But he was telling about how he came to believe in Christ. And he's not a New Testament Christian, but you can't become a New Testament Christian unless first of all you're brought to believe in Christ. But he said, I was raised in a secular Jewish home. Said, uh, nothing was ever brought out about sin. He's in New York. He said, uh, we went to synagogue about twice a year. And he said, literally, I did not know Jesus Christ was a Jew. I was always told he was a Christian. Now, you see, we sit here, and I guarantee you most of us wouldn't have thought that about anybody today. But he said he was down trying to get his clothes washed when he was a freshman in college. And there was a young man down there. He said, Mom had always done my clothes, and I didn't know what to do, and I was trying to figure out what to wash how. And said, I was visiting with him, and he played on the ball team, I forget what basketball, football, or what it was. I said, was that what you're going to do when you graduate college? He said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not good enough for that. So what are you going to do? I'm going to be a missionary. He said, missionary? I never heard of missionary. So I thought missionaries all been killed by the Indians. So <laughs> he said, I didn't, it wasn't in my culture. It wasn't in the areas I walked in. I did not know. As a secular Jew, I didn't. And so the fellow asked me, he said, let me tell you then. Said, Will you let me tell you about, about Jesus Christ? He said, yeah, t tell me. Well, he related what the Bible had to say about Christ. And he said that's when it all came together. And then he made this point, and this is where I am right now. He said, I didn't know I was a sinner. 
I didn't even know specific sins. Among my group of Jews, that's never mentioned. Brethren, in our hands, the gospel is given as a spiritual Israel. And you've got to tell them they're sinners and tell them fornication is sin and lying is sin and adultery is sin. Lying and cursing and all of that is sin. Make it plain to them. And not like you're trying to say, goody, goody, you're going to die and go to hell. Well, I want you to come out of that. I want you to know God's view. And if you don't get back to the Bible, you never will. That's what the world's needing now. Well, look, who am I saying it to? Well, hopefully, over the Internet, it'll, it'll go further. And from what I'm seeing on a few things, it's going quite a ways. <laughs> but you have to specify sin. Paul's writing to Christians in the midst of a society that live like this. And he still specifies these sins and say you can't be once, let, let them not be once named among you. Look how he said the church is to deal with a brother, or in that case a brother, who got caught up in a fornicating situation in Corinth to keep the church pure and to save the person in the sin if possible. Then look at the word uncleanness. What's he talking about? They don't ever take a bath. They don't wash their feet. Is that it? Uncleanness is the Greek word Akatharsia, it is from akatharsos, means unclean, impure. It's used of unclean spirits, Acts 5, 16, Acts 8, 7, and many other places. It's used in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. It's interesting to point out that the word kathiro means to purify. But the word has the negative negating alpha in front of it. Remember what we said about that? Theist, I believe in God. Atheist, atheist, no God. Gnostic, coming from I know. Agnostic, agnostic, where we get our word, means I don't know. Because that little alpha privative before the word means not that. And that's what happens here. It's also valuable to know that the word in, I suppose you understand the papyri, the noun form is used of tenants keeping house in good condition. Well, that means the papyri, as they use common Greek, that's when it's called Koine Greek, and they wrote their grocery list and their letters to one another. That's how they use it. That's how we come to know uh, how some of these words and what they really meant is when we started studying the common Greek the people used as their husbands uh, took their uh, notes from their wives to go to the Jewish Walmart and know what to get and not get in trouble when they got home. They wrote commonly like that. We even have papyri where uh, students off away from home were writing back for money. Strange, some things don't change. It's the word from which our word catharsis, cleansing, comes. It's used of clean linen, clean water, pure gold, pure bread, etc. In the physical sense, of course. In the ceremonial sense, it means pure spiritually. Titus 1.15, 1 first part of the verse. In the moral sense, it means pure, free from guiltiness. I don't commit fornication. Or any of those things connected to it. And then covetousness is the word pleonexia, which is a noun. And it just simply means eager to have more. To have what belongs to others and so on. That idea. It comes from the Greek word pleon, more, and echo, to have. It may be used of material possessions, as it often is, and I won't try to list all that. Greediness, Colossians 3, 5. Now, the adjective, pleoneketes, is the word used in verse 5 here. It's called idolatry in Colossians 3, 5. That's the idea that you're so wedded to desiring these things of monetary value of some way that you're worshiping it. You're dedicated to it. It takes the place of everything else important in your life. Then he says filthiness, and we'll stop with this one. 
filthiness. Ascrotes and comes from ascros, meaning shame, disgrace, and all that is contrary to purity. Now, Thayer in his Greek English lexicon says it means base, dishonorable, and he so cites Ephesians 5 and verse 4. So this refers to obscenity and ugliness and action, disgracefulness, wickedness. Do you see how that the Christian, if they're really of Christ, and that's what Christian means, is careful about every aspect of their conduct? And therefore, you can see why all of us need to continue to grow in this. It also shows you why the Bible says we must be sober-minded, thinking seriously about every thought and action in our relationship to ourselves and to the world around us. I've mentioned many times, and I'll continue to mention it, that most of the New Testament is written to Christians about being faithful. And one way or the other, and we'll continue, Lord willing, next week on these matters, but it's showing us that it's not a haphazard, slipshod manner whereby you just say, well, God's grace is going to make up the rest of it. I really don't have to be too concerned just as long as I don't dibble-dabble too much or as long as I only dibble-dabble some in these, just as long as I don't give myself over to them. Well, if I stop right here, do you think the Bible is teaching that? That's cheap grace. That says God's going to do it all. I don't have to do anything. And that's exactly the false doctrine the devil has sold everybody around us. Yet the Bible is full of material that says, if you love me, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, ye will keep my commandments. Yeah, but Jesus said, let that impress you. He's going to judge you in the light of the New Testament when you stand before him someday and everybody will. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You don't want to stand before him saying, Lord, I loved you. Well, why didn't you get my commandments? Well, if I did that, I'd try to be meriting my way to heaven, earning my way to heaven. Well, he won't say that because he's already said it. He'll just say, depart from me. I never knew you, ye that work iniquity and the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. We have one time in this life to live in such a way as to prove to God we love him and we have faith in him and his system to save us. And that's now. Some of us don't have much longer. And some of us may think we have a lot longer when we don't. If you're not a child of God, please, with all your heart, based upon the scriptures, believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in him as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized for the remission of sins into Christ, Acts 2, 38, Galatians 3, 27. As a child of God... Are you faithful in the light of what we've studied? If not, repent of those sins. Turn from them. Pray God for forgiveness. And once again, rise up and walk the straight and narrow way. The end would be in heaven with God. If you're subject to the Lord's good and great invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.